Welcome to the September program meeting of the Canal Society of New Jersey. Uh, it's good to be with you all again. It's been a long time. Uh, we missed a couple of meetings. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can uh, share um, these, these get-togethers uh, with all of you uh, via Zoom. Hopefully, you'll enjoy the presentation tonight. Uh, some housekeeping, uh, some announcements uh, from the Canal Society. The uh, September uh, newsletter is out today. Uh, uh, it went in the mail today, so you should be receiving yours in, in uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of days. I hope you enjoy it. We put a lot of work into it. There's a, uh, a DNR cover story and uh, a number of really good stories in it, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Uh, Bob Goller, uh, our uh, favorite historian, uh, has had heart surgery uh, in uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, but is recovering well. And he did complete a uh, new copy of Reflections that will be included in the newsletter. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. We're also remembering uh, Deb Wefferling, uh, who passed away early this year. And uh, Deb provided uh, wonderful meals for us at, the, uh, at these meetings, and uh, we really miss her. And also her presence at Waterloo. She was great. She, all the, the, you know, she, she greeted people at the front gate, and uh, she was really a, a joy to work with. So we, we miss her greatly. Uh, some things that have been happening uh, this year. Uh, fortunately, we were able to do a little programming at Waterloo. Uh, not much. Uh, we got a notification uh, just on the uh, last day of July that we could do some programming during August. And so uh, Tim Roth and I uh, um, and, and, and Jeff actually uh, pitched in and uh, for a couple of Saturdays managed to, to meet and greet visitors to Waterloo um, with a good deal of success. We have talked to a lot of people. State Parks was running um, uh, some walking tours through the village and uh, we got to meet a lot of people. We had some nice sales. We had some good conversations and unfortunately only lasted until Labor Day. And so um, I'm afraid Waterloo programming is, is, is over for this year. Looking forward to that uh, in the coming year. We'll have to let you know. Um, we have been working very hard uh, on Greenway issues. Uh, just uh, this past uh, 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 early in September, we completed two Greenway projects, one in, in Booton and one in Lincoln Park. We contributed uh, a, a, a trailhead kiosk for Grace Lord Park in, in Booton, and that uh, those signs were delivered, but I don't think they're yet installed. Lincoln Park, we gave them three new signs for their Greenway Trail, including one for, um, um, for Lock, uh, Lock 14, I believe. And so uh, those have been installed. Um, and so uh, we're looking forward to uh, putting that up on our, our website. Um, in in Booton, uh, we have created a, uh, a walking tour brochure. And uh, we have, since, since so many people have been out walking because of the COVID during the outdoors, uh, we were going to take advantage of that. We uh, created a walking tour brochure and uh, uh, acquired two uh, brochure racks and uh, have them up at, uh, at key points along the uh, the Greenway Trail, and we've already printed up 1,500 copies of the uh, of the brochure, and they've been going like hotcakes. So we find that was really very successful. Uh, also, uh, uh, we are advertising in uh, Skylands Magazine in the fall issue. Um, Come and explore the Mars Canal Greenway. Um, something that we haven't done before. Uh, we're asking people to come out and join us walking on the Greenway and uh, in order to find out uh, uh, interesting places to go, we ask them to, um, to uh, uh, log on to our website and we've got a selection of brochures uh, and maps uh, up there. Uh, and so um, you'll be receiving a, a link to that new uh, section of the, uh, of the uh, uh, website uh, Tim Roth will be sending that out shortly. Um, we may not have your, your favorite um, Greenway location up there yet, but we've got uh, some interesting brochures and uh, we'll be adding to them as we go along uh, until we finally 
have a, a really good representation of all the, the wonderful Greenway experiences that you can have. Um, let's see. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to have a symposium this year. Um, we canceled it early in the year. But we've usually been having a symposium in the spring, but we've been unsuccessful in being able to get a venue to hold it and uh, 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 a number of speakers that would make it worthwhile. Uh, some of you um, actually uh, sent in your money to attend the symposium. And uh, if you would like uh, us to return your money, we would be glad to do that. If you would like to consider that to be a donation, we would enjoy that also, but uh, we certainly don't want to hold your money under false pretenses. Okay, um, this evening we have uh, Vince Hydro, historian and author, and uh, an incredibly knowledgeable guy, and he's going to be talking to us about the Switchback Railroad uh, and Mock Chunk. Vince, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do I got to do something here now? Uh, you should have an option at the bottom of your screen that says share, uh, share screen. Okay. Let's see. Oh, actually, I seem to have lost it now. Yeah, my, I lost the uh, I lost the video. Are you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you. I can't see anything. Oh, I don't see anything now. It just says Zoom. I don't know what happened. See, if there's a small window, if you double click on it, it'll bring up the full application again. Let me see here what I did. Uh, let me see here. I clicked on something. Share right now. He's having trouble getting rid of it. Okay. All right. Now, what do I got to do here? Share screen? Click share screen? Yes. Okay. On the train board. And I think. Share. All right. How's that? Very good. We can see it, but I don't think we're at the first page. No. There we go. We're scrolling through now. Yeah, I'm I'm at the wrong spot. Let me end this and get back to the get back to the beginning. Right. Oops, that's not the, that's not the presentation mode. That's the presentation mode. Okay. Sorry about that. Very good. We're All we're right. seeing it properly now. Okay. Uh, this, so this is uh, about the Summit Hill and Mock Chunk Switchback and Gravity Railroad. And um, it's certainly important to the canals of New Jersey for the coal that was transported on the switchback uh, was discharged into the Lehigh Canal. And then at Easton, it uh, was either transshipped over the Morris Canal or went down the Delaware to Bristol or went and was uh, transshipped over the Delaware and, and Raritan Canal. So. It is important to New Jersey and the canals in New Jersey. Um, if you're interested in reading more about my, my uh, switchback, I did write a book on it. It was published by the Canal History and Technology Press in 2002, and they are available at the Easton Museum. Uh, it's going to be out of print, uh, what, so whatever they have, uh, when it's gone, it's gone. It's, uh, it's not, not a big seller, and it is a real thick book. It's everything you would want to know about the switchback and more. Um, okay, so the story begins um, in 1791 with the discovery of coal on Sharp Mountain near present-day Summit Hill, which is nine miles distant from Mock Chunk, which is now Jim Thorpe. I keep hitting the wrong button. And the story goes that uh, Philip Ginder discovered this stone coal under the roots of an upturned tree, but I think this, uh, this picture really shows who the true discoverer of the coal was. It was probably his dog. Because why would a hunter be looking under the roots of an upturned tree? But anyway, um, this discovery resulted a year later in the formation of the Lehigh Coal Mine Company in Philadelphia, which had limited success commercially in getting the coal to markets. Uh, there was uh, some leases to some Wilkes-Barre entrepreneurs that were able to ship some coal during the War of 1812, 
And uh, there's a book called Philadelphia's First Fuel Crisis that talks about that. But it wasn't until 18, 18, 18, 19 that, um, Let's see, I'm having trouble there, seeing my writing. Okay. Uh, Josiah White and Erskine Hazard, two uh, Philadelphia Quakers, formed the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company and settled the town of Mock Chunk, and they built a uh, graded stone turnpike from the coal mine to the landing on the Lehigh River and a descending only navigation on the Lehigh River. And that consisted of, you probably have heard about the Bear Trap Locks, uh, that were constructed by White and uh, used to uh, create artificial freshets on the Lehigh River so that they could get the coal all the way to Philadelphia. And that was a descending only navigation. It wasn't until 1829 that a two-way navigation was completed. So parts of that stone turnpike are still in existence. And White and Hazard, when they built the stone turnpike, they had the attention of putting a railroad over it. And so they actually graded it and it's um, allegedly the first road in America that was built uh, in a graded fashion. Des they called it descending only. Uh, and they built it using uh, leveling instruments that were borrowed from Benjamin Morgan. And if you ever get up to Jim Thorpe and you wanna walk on this stone turnpike, it's below the breast of the dam, the Mock Chunk Dam, which is west of Mock Chunk. And it's a beautiful road and there's some really nice constructions on it that are still there. And, and you can tell this is a stone turnpike because the, uh, the pathway is, uh, is laid with stone and it kept uh, ruts from forming in the road, um, but it also jarred the coal and created plumes of dust around the cart and the driver. But they're beautiful uh, uh, construction along the way. And the railroad was built over the top of this stone turnpike uh, for about five miles of the, um, of the old turnpike. And it diverged right below the breast of the dam and you could almost follow it all the way into town. It is preserved inside uh, Jim Thorpe. This is uh, called Trap Alley. And the, uh, behind me is the Opera House on Hill Road in Mock Chunk. And this alley that you see is called Trap Alley. And that was part of the old stone turnpike. And it was called Trap Alley because there was a wheelwright right shop at this location where they actually built and tested the bear trap lock. And this is a, uh, this is a beautiful section of a beautiful 1826 watercolor map that was drawn by Solomon Roberts and presented to Rebecca White. And it shows um, the, the bear trap locks and uh, some other really interesting features here. And it shows the diversion of the coal road from present day Broadway. So uh, this is the wheelwright shop and the bear trap, uh, currently the Mock Chunk Opera House. And uh, the Mock Chunk Creek, and that runs right underneath that wheelwright shop. And that's how they were able to test out the bear trap locks. And there was a mill race uh, that used the Mock Chunk Creek to turn a grist mill in town. And this is current Broadway in town. So you can actually walk on Broadway, and if you go up to the Opera House, you could find Trap Alley and walk on the old uh, coal road. And Josiah White's house is shown on here, and the stone turnpike leading right down to the river, and at one of the bear trap locks, and then the coal loading dock on the Lehigh River. So this is a beautiful map that we're lucky to have. In 1820, the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company was able to ship 365 tons of coal to Philadelphia uh, at a fixed price. And that, according to some historians, marked the onset of the American Industrial Revolution. It actually convinced uh, consumers that uh, stone coal was a reliable way to heat their homes. And in 1827, they began construction of the Gravity Railroad in January. So the first time I ever wrote, read that, I wondered why in the world would they start a railroad in the beginning of January, in the middle of winter. Well, it turns out after further research that that was the, the stockholders meeting in Philadelphia where Josiah White was supposed to be asking permission to build the railroad. So he, he went and started the railroad and later um, had to uh, ask for forgiveness. <laughs> in reality, 
uh, the railroad, railroad tracks had actually been built a year earlier within the Great Quarry at Sharp Mountain, uh, at the Sharp Mountain site where Ginder discovered coal. And that, that site became uh, an area, a gigantic quarry uh, with railroad tracks within it, and it lasted until 1847 when the coal ran out. Now the uh, switchback was built using strap iron, and this photograph shows how the strap iron was laid on wooden rails, uh, which were then laid on wooden ties. But the original design was to use stone blocks. And there's a whole story about why the stone blocks were not used. They, were, they went to the, the wooden ties instead of the stone blocks. And that had to do with Erskine Hazard going to England and discovering that these stone blocks actually resulted in a lot of problems. And yet, in 1830, Josiah White began construction of another gravity railroad called the Room Run Gravity Railroad, and he used the stone blocks there. Why would he go from the uh, proven method of using wooden ties to stone blocks, uh, even against the advice of Erskine Hazard? And that's another story uh, that we don't have time to do here, but it's in my book on the Room Run Railroad. And this is how they would actually um, attach the uh, rails to the stone blocks. But you have to imagine that this uh, T rail here is actually a wooden rail. And this is actually uh, was shot in the bottom in the basement of the uh, Franklin Institute, uh, these stone blocks. And I do have a book on the Room Run Rail Railroad if anybody's interested in getting one. Um, it's on Amazon, uh, but if you send me a check or use PayPal, I'll pay for the shipping and tax. So as soon as the railroad was built, uh, it started carrying passengers. The people came from Philadelphia and New York to ride the Gravity Railroad and they would stay at Mock Chunk's famous Mansion House Hotel. And one of the earliest and most famous persons to ride the railroad was Anne Royale, who was probably the first female travel writer in America. She came in 1828. She missed um, uh, Audubon by a year. She stayed in the Mansion House and rode the switchback and she was upset because she had to pay the standard fear. And she was a very critical person. Uh, you can uh, get copies of her travel diary and she really criticizes people. On her way to, the, uh, uh, to Mok Chunk, she uh, was not impressed with the Irish laborers on the canal. And she was once arrested and charged with being a common scold. And she's known for getting John Quincy Adams to give her an interview. And the way she did this, she knew that he would go and bathe in the Potomac in the nude and she went and sat on his clothes. And, uh, and wouldn't get off until he gave her the interview. And she, uh, she had a lot of criticism about the, uh, the landlord at the Mansion House Hotel. She met Josiah White and she was really impressed with him and his daughter and his, uh, his wife. Another uh, famous person was Carl Bodmer, the, uh, the uh, artist. He came with Prince Maximilian of Weed in the early 1830s and he painted the watercolor of Mock Chunk's first coal chute. And this is a pretty famous view um, that uh, most people are aware of. A lot of the uh, publications of the Canal Museum use this, uh, this uh, picture. Well, in June of 1829, the LCNN replaced the descending only navigation with the Lehigh Canal, which allowed for travel in both directions. The problem was is that the Delaware Canal was not ready yet to receive the canal boats. And so they continued to use the flat bottom arcs until 1833. And that actually brought, is what brought to Mock Chunk Asa Packer, who later was uh, famous for starting the uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad. And it also allowed for the completion of the Room Run Railroad. And in 1838, they completed the upper division of the canal all the way to Whitehaven. But at the end of the 1837 season, uh, the passenger traffic was uh, interfering with the coal traffic because it was only one track. And they had some turnouts but they still had a lot of interference between uh, coal and passenger traffic. So they stopped the passenger traffic for a short period of time. A few years later, in January of 1841, there was a great ice freshet on the Lehigh River, which completely destroyed the LCNN's canal, which was their only source of income. For the first time, they had to mortgage all of their property uh, to pay for the rebuilding the canal and uh, the interest payments were so much that they had to drastically increase coal production. 
An interesting thing about that freshhead is Josiah White was getting up there in age. He actually toured the entire canal in the wintertime after that, and he was almost heartbroken with all the damage that had been done. But, to, but in order to increase coal production, they had to build a return track. And so they completed this return track in 1846, and that allowed for increased uh, coal production. It allowed for uh, resumption of passenger travel and allowed them to open new mines. And it utilized two steam-driven incline planes, one on Mount Jefferson, uh, right at Mock Chunk, and one near Summit Hill near the mines. This is a map of uh, 1860. Uh, it shows Mock Chunk and the route of the Gravity Railroad, and I actually have a close-up in here so that you could see the incline plane, and you can also see the Room Run Railroad where it comes in. So I have a couple things here to show you so you can get your feel from where you are, showing where East Mock Chunk is. And this is the Room Run River Plane coming from Nesquahoning, and it terminated at uh, a lumber yard on the Lehigh Canal. And this is the Mount Pisgah incline plane backtrack where the empty cars were hauled up the incline plane and coasted nine miles to the foot of the Mount Jefferson plane. And then they were pulled up that plane uh, to return to the mines. We had another plane here and interestingly, it was operated by a water turbine on the upper Mock Chunk Dam. And it utilized uh, what Josiah White called his propellers, which was a way of mechanically transmitting power up an inclined plane. Uh, the railroad was in the form of a figure eight and where it crossed over was known as the Five Mile Tree Crossover. And you could see a tourist car on uh, at that uh, crossover. This car is heading towards the right, which would be the bottom of Mount Jefferson Plain and the, uh, the returning cars would be going underneath this car on their way back to Mock Chunk. And I just wanted to add this so you could get a feel for what the inclined plane looked like in relationship to the town. And that's the Mount Pisgah Plain. And you can also see the ruins of the uh, Room Run River Plain and the village of Nesquahoning where the Room Run mines were located. And uh, about the same time, we started having photographers come to Mark Chunk. And so there's some really nice early views of the incline plane at both at Mount Pisgah and Mount Jefferson. And this one, you can see a, a train of coal cars waiting to be pushed up the incline plane. They were actually pushed up by safety cars called Barney cars. And of course, um, the passenger cars as well. And there have been many, many statements uh, over the years saying that there was never an accident on the switchback railroad. And there, were, uh, there was an incredibly no large number of accidents on the switchback. And in my book, I have a whole appendix devoted to a sampling of some of those accidents. And um, one of Asa Packer's son was actually involved in an accident on the uh, uh, switchback in 1853 uh, when one of their passenger cars collided with a coal car. And that was quite common occurrence. Now we're looking uh, down the Mount Pisgah incline plane here and the uh, upper Mock Chunk village is up there in the upper right. And this is a safety car uh, or also known as a Barney car. And it was hauled up with the use of iron bands which you could see attached to the front of the safety car. And it actually pushed up uh, the empties or the passenger cars. And that was so that uh, you wouldn't have to attach a cable to the empty cars as you were pulling them up the incline plane. It allowed for quicker movement. And there was a safety mechanism on the Mount Pisgah incline plane. It was called the safety ratchet or the cat step. And there was a device that was lowered down onto that cat step as the safety car was pulled up and it made a ratcheting sound. And it was there so that if the band broke or something else happened to the engine, the car couldn't go back backwards down the inclined plane. And the bands did break at various times. And I don't, it's, it's strange to me why that cat step, why that ratchet device is not down on the cat step in this picture. Um, but um, it, there were times when the, band, when the bands broke and the a car would be stuck on the inclined plane until they were able to do the repairs. Now what's interesting is on the Mount Jefferson inclined plane, they didn't use that. 
There's no safety ratchet. You can't see it. There's nothing in between. Instead, they use something called an outrigger leg. And this is a device that had a pivot right to the left of the arrowhead that, I'm, that I have shown there. So that if there was any backward motion, that leg would drop down and catch in between the spaces between the railroad ties. <laughs> it seemed strange and it didn't work. There were several occasions where the bands broke and a whole train of uh, empty cars went plummeting down the uh, mountainside uh, doing tremendous damage. It's just lucky, I guess, sheer luck that there were never passenger cars uh, on there when that happened. And of course you can see the iron bands there. Well, the, the name Switchback came about because they, in, uh, in order to increase coal production, since the Great Mine was giving out, they had to go north into the Panther Valley and open coal mines there. And there's, there's tremendous amounts of coal in the Panther Valley at the time, and there still is. And in order to get down the hillside, they invented two switches, two sets of switches uh, that were used to create a switchback effect. And they were invented by George Washington Salkeld, and that uh, caused the railroad to become known as the switchback. And it allowed passengers, actually, uh, riders on the railroad to go down into the valley, surprisingly, and tour the mines and um, the breakers and everything. And, and tourists loved it. They were charged an extra 25 cents to go down into the valley. Now, this is uh, a, from a book uh, by MS Henry, History of the Lehigh Valley. And it actually shows the location of the switches that uh, were just on the previous map. And um, it's interesting. That's the only uh, picture we have anywhere showing, showing these switches. And there were a lot of write-ups, though, about how these things worked. And they're very interesting. Um, but they didn't stay in service very long. They were replaced with uh, tracks that more closely conformed to the curvature of the mountainside. So they were only in service maybe 11 years or so. But the, ra the railroad still became known as the switchback, still was known as the switchback after that. Now, these are the inclined planes that were in the Panther Valley. There was, at one time, there was as many as five planes, but uh, in the long run, only two remained. And you could see that uh, they don't have the cat step uh, either. And they used wire ropes for pulling the Barney car up. And that's mainly because these, uh, Barney cars and these inclined planes uh, pulled up loaded coal cars, and so they had to use wire rope uh, in order to for the to be strong enough to withstand the weight of the coal cars. And surprisingly, um, children would play on these uh, inclined planes with uh, with you know expected effects. There were a lot a lot of uh, injuries to children, and the tourists were allowed to tour some of the breakers in the Panther Valley. And this is showing one of those breakers. And there was a uh, stereographer named uh, M.A. Kleckner who took a whole series of these views in the Panther Creek Valley. And this is a slate picker, uh, sl slate picker shandy down in the Panther Valley at the time that Kleckner uh, caught on camera. Well, they also added two additional switches near Mock Chunk for bringing coal from the Hackle Barney Tunnel to the Mock Chunk Chutes. Now, Hackle, the Hackle Barney Tunnel was two miles from Mock Chunk, and it supposedly is the first deep mining tunnel in, the, in, in America. And they, they uh, mined coal there early on, but didn't tap the vein that they expected to before they went into the Panther Valley. But they reopened it once the switchback was built, once the backtrack was built, excuse me. And this is showing, uh, again, so you can see the Room Run Railroad in this location to the the switchback. So this is the switchback down track showing uh, the track leading, uh, taking uh, full call cars down into the Mock Chunk to the river, and then the return track going back to the mines. And then the location of the Hackle Barney Tunnel and the Lehigh River. So this is a close up showing uh, the uh, switchback that they built uh, to tap the coal from this uh, mine. Now the, the map shows the switches as if they're curves, but they really are switches. There was an east and a west switch here. And they actually built an additional gravity railroad to hook onto the switchback. And 
parts of that are still there that, that hikers use. And where it actually tapped into the down track was a place called Board Bottom. And this is a map showing uh, how they utilized it. Before they built these additional switches, they actually took coal down to the Five Mile Tree crossover that I talked about, and then down to the river to the chutes. Uh, but in 1854, they added these additional switches and the Hackle-Barney uh, Gravity Railroad. And that's the Hackle-Barney Tunnel, which is still there. And if you hike along the switchback, it's a great uh, hiking trail. It's a great biking trail. And people, uh, you either have to cross a thin ledge or you have to go down and see the tunnel mouth to get past this. And I'll explain why in a little while. And there's the... Uh, root of it and you can actually see uh, the location of one of the switches if you if you so choose to see it and this is a uh, this what was called the stand on the back track where uh, coal cars were switched on to the switchback from the Hackle Barney tunnel and that's still there and this is uh, this location called board bottom where there was a bridge carrying the cars from Hackle Barney tunnel over this uh, route to uh, the down track, and that's still there too. But in, in uh, 1868, the tunnel mouth collapsed, and the part of the back track uh, was pull, pulled down too. And they built a trestle there, which was later uh, consumed by fire after the switchback had been abandoned. And so if you are hiking this trail or, or taking your bike, you actually have to walk uh, alongside the mountain there on that, that narrow ledge that you see there, Either that or you'll go down around the tunnel mouth. And some people do carry their bikes across that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the coal cars um, dump their coal down some inclined planes into uh, waiting canal boats. And uh, this is a beautiful representation. I really like this showing uh, these sh what these chutes look like on the river. And there were about five of them, at, <coughs> excuse me, at one time. And this is the, the, um, what it looked like in 1854. Uh, just to give you a little uh, idea what it, where, where things are, the Lehigh River there and the coal cars coming down from the summit mines. And so because the uh, coal traveled nine miles, the, uh, it, the cars jostling, even though it was a railroad, it was, the wheels weren't perfect and the, top, the rails weren't perfect. And so the coal rattled around a lot, it got broken up and there was a lot of dirt carried from the mines, even though they had breakers at the mines. By the time the coal got down to these chutes, it was dirty and a lot of, a lot of dirt, a lot of broken pieces. So they actually rebroke the coal and they cleaned it at, the, uh, at these chutes. They had, um, at the bottom of each of these chutes, they had what are rolling screen mechanisms that were driven by this propeller mechanism that you see there. And what that was, it was, it was a, like a crankshaft, a gigantic crankshaft that was powered from a water turbine at the lower dam. And it was open, it was open to the atmosphere and children would get on this, uh, this crankshaft and ride it like it was a, like log rolling and with expected results, there were many, many children hurt on there, but they would, uh, that propeller mechanism would turn these rolling screens at the bottom of the chute that would actually help separate the coal into different sizes. And then the dirt was carried on the dirt tracks down below the breast of uh, the lower dam and dumped into the Lehigh River. And over time, that coal dirt being dumped into the, liver, into the river would create a lot of problems. And I just highlighted Edwin Douglas's house. That was originally Josiah White's house. Edwin Douglas lived in it later. He was superintendent of the LCNN and then John Lysenring would live there. And uh, right above that, uh, Edwin Douglas house is the location, the current location of the Asa Packer Mansion. If you ever get to Jim Thorpe, it's a great uh, place to visit. Not this year, it's not being opened this year. This is a view of the same thing we just looked at, but it's taken from an aerial position. Surprisingly, there is no physical location where you could actually see this view. So we, we believe that this was taken from a hot air balloon and there were hot air balloon ascensions from Mach Chunk in the 1850s. So this is East Mach Chunk and the coal tracks coming down from the mines. 
And there were additional coal chutes on the opposite side of the river for coal coming from Beaver Meadow and the Hazleton mines. And then dam number one of the lower division. And then chute number one, which we were just looking at on that colored view. And that's the propeller mechanism. And you could see it's open to the, open to the atmosphere. And it's a long, gigantic crankshaft that went from turbine water wheel uh, that was powered from the, uh, the, the water power at the lower dam. And that turned that long crankshaft and turned those rolling screens. And they made a tremendous racket in town and they created a tremendous uh, billows of coal dirt in the atmosphere. But that was washed away uh, in the June 1862 flood, which was another big flood on the Lehigh River. Those rolling screens, all the chutes were washed away and they were never, the uh, rolling screens were never replaced. The chutes were replaced, but, they, but the uh, rolling screens weren't. And that is the dirt tracks that would carry the uh, coal dirt. Uh, coal cars, or dirt cars, excuse me, pulled by mules would haul the dirt collected at the bottom of the rolling screens and dump it below the river, or below the dam, excuse me. And there again is Edwin Douglas's house, so you can get an idea of comparing it to that previous um, screen. Now, like I said, after 1862, they didn't replace the rolling screens. And what they did instead was had uh, hoppers that would collect the dust. And they ran a water trough from the upper dam to the lower dam. And that water trough would carry away uh, the coal dirt that was collected in those hoppers. And because there was still slate transferred from the mines, you had slate pickers uh, on these chutes in addition to slate pickers at the coal breakers themselves. In fact, a lot of the uh, uh, canal boat veterans, when they became too old to, to captain their canal boats, they would go back to being slate pickers either at the breakers or on these chutes. How are we doing for time? Okay, this is looking down chute number one, which is the chute that we saw in the color picture. And I, uh, I highlight this coal shipping office so that you can get an idea from, for some of these uh, uh, locations. So I talked about this great freshet. Uh, the LCNN had to replace the upper division of the canal with the Lehigh and Susquehanna Railroad, along with the Nesquehoning Valley Railroad and tunnel that made the switchback obsolete as a coal hauler. So in December of 1872, the last coal train passed down the switchback railroad. The coal chutes were demolished. And this is a picture showing the demolition of those chutes. And you can see that coal shipping office on the left-hand side of the picture. Well, after the coal chutes were dismantled, uh, it allowed Harry Packer to build his stables uh, where the chutes were. And off to the right, uh, the Kemmerer Mansion was built. That was a mansion that was built by John Lysenring, who had taken over as superintendent engineer when Edwin Douglas died. He built that for his daughter and her husband, Malin Kemmerer. And that mansion is no longer standing. It was torn down in 1927. But again, you can see the coal shipping office, so you have an idea where that chute came down. It basically came down where in between the uh, mansion stables and the Kemmerer mansion. And the coal port loading docks then were used to haul coal, or excuse me, transfer coal from the uh, mines in the Panther Valley to canal boats. And later, those chutes were uh, removed uh, from coal port uh, which is just above Jim Thorpe. They were removed down to Laurie Station, uh, just above Northampton. But surprisingly, they, they, uh, the switchback had been making so much money as a tourist attraction that they, uh, that they continued in, in operation, in fact, for the next five decades. And the Lehigh Valley Railroad and the Central Railroad of New Jersey uh, began running excursions that carried uh, many, many people on the railroad. In fact, um, during the uh, glory, what I call the glory days, the 1880s and early 1890s, there were days when the, uh, these uh, excursions would bring uh, more than 5,000 people into the town on a single day. And the tourists came for some of the views, which were very nice. And in particular, one view, which was uh, the trestle on top of Mount Pisgah, which was used to overcome a gap in the mountainside. And they built new stations in Upper Mock Chunk and at Summit Hill for the, for the passengers uh, to get on and off. 
Well, when the uh, switchback was no longer used for hauling coal, the inclined planes in the Panther Valley were dismantled. So the passengers couldn't go down into the Panther Valley anymore. So they needed some tourist attractions in uh, at the other end of the switchback. And so, so um, somebody had started a fire in one of the old uh, slopes back in 1859. It was an accidentally set, but it turned into this gigantic uh, inferno underground, almost like Centralia. And the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company spent millions of dollars trying to put the fire out. And I believe it just finally burned itself out. They did put a concrete barrier in at one time, but they, they, they spent tons and tons of money trying all different solutions that never worked. But the tourists really loved it, especially because on the other side of the burning mines, there was an ice cave so that in the, in the middle of summer, they could walk across this inferno and then go down into a, into a cave where there were actually ice crystals forming from, due, due to the cold. And uh, uh, photographers, there was many, many uh, photo opportunities on the switchback and there's tons and tons of pictures of the switchback. I've tried to include a lot of them in my book, uh, as many as I could find at the time. But over the years, as the horseless carriage replaced the horse and as uh, rail excursions into town declined, uh, parking became a problem, and it's a, par a problem to this day in Jim Thorpe. In fact, uh, for a while they were talking about rebuilding the switchback, and um, they did an engineering feasibility study, and the engineering uh, study said, yeah, it's feasible to build it, but uh, I did a quick financial calculation and showed them that it was impossible to get enough cars into the Jim Thorpe uh, per day to even pay the interest on the cost of rebuilding that railroad. Plus, um, much of the right of way is now gone. But so on October 29th, 1933, the last car uh, made its trip over the Switchback Railroad. And this picture uh, showed up in Philadelphia newspapers, them putting away the last car on the railroad. It made headlines in a lot of states. And they um, switched back, went up for uh, auction, and they auctioned it off to a junk dealer. And so the, uh, the urban legend started that uh, we sold all of our iron to, on the switchback to uh, Japan, and it came back to us in the form of bullets and uh, uh, other ordnance. Today, it's a nice hiking trail. It's been preserved. And this is the location of that five mile tree crossover that I showed previously. And it's, an, it's a, a round trip hike uh, anywhere between uh, 16, eh, maybe 16 miles if you do a round trip. It's a very nice biking trail as well. And in 1970 switch, 76, excuse me, the switchback was uh, included on the National Register of Historic Places. And what about this, the Mock Chunk switchback as the first roller coaster? Well, this, the uh, Smithsonian has actually called the switchback, the Mock Chunk switchback, the first real roller coaster in America. They've given it that designation. They actually, um, uh, on their uh, HD channel, maybe about five years ago, they did a segment on inventions. And one of those segments was on the roller coaster. And they came to town uh, to include the Mock Chunk switchback in this uh, section on roller coasters. They spent about eight hours filming me and used like five seconds of it. <laughs> well, in 1880, these two gentlemen uh, began an operating lease of the switchback uh, for about 20 years. And in fact, during their tenure, one of the worst accidents happened on the railroad. It was uh, on a, a 4th of July, the uh, car, a car was coming to Mark Chunk and it was started raining. So the cars had um, curtains on the side that they could lower to keep out the rain. So they stopped the car and to, in order to get the curtains down and another car coming down behind them rammed into them and people got uh, thrown from the car. There were some severed limbs and I think maybe one death. And um, the next day they continued to say that there had never been an accident on the switchback. Uh, there was a lawsuit that came out of that and uh, the results of which are not known at this time.
But in 1884, Lamarcus Thompson constructed his Atlantic City Railway at Coney Island. And some writers suggested that he took a ride on Mock Chunk Switchback and that inspired his idea for the early roller coaster. But in late November of 1890, the Mumfords, they actually proposed construction of a true roller coaster, which they called the Dunderberg Spiral Railway uh, near West Point on the Hudson. Now this railroad uh, was very complex. It used electric engines to pull the cars up inclined planes. In fact, they were working with Thomas Edison on designing some engines and it was never built. They could not, uh, they could not make uh, brakes that work well enough to keep the cars from flying off on some of the severe curves. And so this railroad was, this railway was never built. This roller coaster was never built. And maybe that was a good thing. So there were some famous people who rode the switchback that we know of. Anne Royale, who I mentioned, Prince Maximilian and artist Carl Bodmer, President Ulysses S. Grant rode the switchback, President and Mrs. Grover Cleveland rode the switchback. In fact, um, there was a time when um, Grover Cleveland came through town on Harry Packer's palace car, which was called the Minerva, but he didn't, uh, he wouldn't even come to the door uh, to greet the crowd that came to see him. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually made two whistle stops in uh, East Mock Chunk, uh, but he did not ride the switchback. And Lewis Comfort Tiffany rode the switchback. Um, Tiffany came up the Lehigh Canal uh, in a converted canal scow in 1886, I believe, with his fiance, who was the daughter of Lafayette's uh, college's um, uh, dean. And they, they came to Mock Chunk, they toured the switchback and took some great photographs. You probably have seen them if you've seen the, um, the uh, book on the Lehigh Canal that the Canal Museum put out, the one that has a lot of photographs in it. They included some of Tiffany's photographs that he took on the canal near Mock Chunk. And uh, the Astors came to town and Don Pedro, uh, the emperor of Brazil rode the switchback. Thomas Edison came twice and his wife also came by herself after uh, Thomas Edison had passed away. And that's it. Um, I, I could probably do about eight hours on the switchback, but I tried to uh, keep it within a reasonable time and that's not too bad. Thank you very much. You, uh, you can email me if you'd like. Um, I'm on Facebook and Messenger as well. I can answer any questions you might have. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. Uh, we have one question that came in via the chat. It was how long was the crankshaft that popped up when we were uh, showing the, uh, the dirt track? Um, let's see, I would estimate that crankshaft would have been probably anywhere from a quarter to a half a mile. Uh, I've got a question myself. Did uh, Grover Cleveland uh, ride the switchback on two non-consecutive occasions or just once? I, I, I think I've only found that he rode it on one occasion. No, nah, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else with any questions, please type them into the chat. We have a few minutes here. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Okay, uh, is there anything at Summit Hill uh, of the switchback or the mining operation to, to, to be seen? Uh, the, the switchback, um, there's uh, some remains of where the uh, railroad crossed over uh, the highway. There is also where the station was located, they have a replica car standing there. Uh, otherwise, no, the, uh, in fact, the switchback actually ran through, ran along most of the streets in town and uh, there, of course, with accidents, of course, children coming out and playing on the rails, but um, no, there's nothing to see uh, really in the town. There is the, uh, of course, though, if you go down to Lansford, you can tour the number nine mine museum. You can actually go in a, uh, a coal mine that's in its original state. If you go up to Ashland, uh, they have a uh, coal mine that's been cleaned up and it's very, uh, uh, it's, it's not, in its real condition, what it was like when the miners were in. But if you go to Lansford, to the number nine mine, it's just like when the miners were working there. It's very interesting. 
think I had one more slide here I wanted to bring up too. Oh yes, I did. I did just come out with another new book on Asa Packer's uh, children. Um, if anybody's interested, that's also on Amazon. But if you if you want to get it directly from me through either a check or a PayPal, I'll pay for the shipping and taxes. Uh, I, I myself, I have been to that Ashland. I think it's the Pioneer Coal Mine. Pioneer, yes. Model. Yes, I have a, a a genuine Loki track spike from there as a souvenir I got as a kid. Uh, another question came in asking uh, about the trails. Uh, if you want a tour today, uh, do you recommend a mountain bike for that? Um, the the trail's not in too bad of shape. It it doesn't and it doesn't have the ballast on it like a lot of the rail trails have on it. Uh, I think people, um, most of the people that ride it, you know, just can use a regular bike, but you see people with the real fancy bikes and then you see people with, you know, uh, the bare minimum bi of bike too. Uh, it, it doesn't allow motorized vehicles on it. So you do have to use um, your, your mat muscle power. Um, but uh, yeah, the trail's not too bad. It's not too bad a shape. Not one of those racing bikes, but other than that, you might be all right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's also great for walking, too. I have a comment about uh, about Vince's book on the um, on the switchback, and uh, he's much, much, much too modest on that subject. It's a fine book, <laughs> and if there's any copies out there, you 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 history for people, you you people like me who who just have to have uh, have those books better go out and buy it before it disappears. It's a really good book. Yeah, I think the uh, Canal Museum is even has even reduced the price now on it too because it just wasn't selling. Mm. I think I might. I, I think I we talked about this before we started this. I'm. I may in the future. I may uh, reproduce it uh, in individual chat as individual chapters. I'm. Th I've kind of been thinking about that because people have been asking for certain sections of it that they like to see, like the Panther Valley, the uh, number nine museum would like to have the Panther Valley section as a book. So uh, that's something I'm thinking about for the future. But the land, actually Lansford has a new historical society too, which is very, very interesting. And they have got a lot of maps if you like to look at maps. Well, Vince, thank you very much. This has been a great presentation. It's been good to have you, and uh, we really enjoyed uh, your talk. Thank uh, you. Canal Society members, we're uh, glad to be with you tonight. Uh, we'll have a, another meeting in November, and it'll be a, a Zoom meeting as well. Um, you'll be getting an email uh, probably sometime in October about the pr presentation and about the timing, so watch for that in your email. <laughs> Uh, you folks who are listening in tonight who are not members, uh, please consider joining the Canal Society. You can do that online. Go to our website at Canal Society, New Jersey, uh, canalsocietynj.org, and uh, you can sign up right online. And please take a look at our new section on the uh, Morris Canal Greenway. Um, then, um, with that said, uh, if there are no more questions, I'm going to end the meeting and looking forward to being with you all again in November. Please watch for your newsletters in the mail. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy uh, what we've done and uh, we're looking forward to being with you again. Give the website again. Uh, website, uh, Morris, uh, uh, Morris Canal, Canal Society, nj.org. Okay, thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.